Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce you today, Lisa Prescott, who's the Director of Admissions at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Lisa, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm great. It's a little hot out here today, but otherwise, <laughs> I'm great. <laughs> well, it's an honor and pleasure to have you, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation, Lisa. So why don't we get right to it and ask about yourself. Tell us, Lisa, how long have you been in admissions, and how did you end up in such a position? You know, it's funny because... I didn't plan this career. <laughs> and if you had asked me as a high school student, what do you want to be in your career? I would have never guessed I'd end up in college admissions. So I grew up in San Diego, California, um, first generation student, really didn't think about going away to college because I truly thought that was just for you know, the privilege, the wealthier students. So I was planning to just go to my local community college and transfer to my local Cal State school. And just sort of on a whim, I decided, well, I'll just apply, see what happens. Somebody told me Santa Barbara was really beautiful and students <laughs> lived on the beach. And I thought, couldn't get any better than that. And so I applied and was admitted. And, you know, once I came to college and found out about fi all the financial aid I qualified for and such, I realized that I could have gone to a four-year school all along. Not that I didn't get a great education at the community college, but my only reason for choosing it was because of cost, because I didn't know financial aid existed. So... I got very involved in school. I, you know, was here at UC Santa Barbara as a transfer student, got involved as a resident assistant in the residence halls and worked summer orientation staff and all these fun student services kinds of jobs. And I thought when I was graduating, you know what, I bet there are a lot of people who don't realize they can go to college. And so I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a job where I got to talk to people about college and you can do this and it's you know it's at your doorstep pursue it and then somebody told me you know there's a job like that in the office of admissions and it's a, just so happened literally that a position was open and I applied and got it and have been here ever since so I I tell students in a sense I got my dream job straight out of college and so just worked my way up to being director of admissions it was never a planned goal but it, it's a very fulfilling job. Well, it sounds like they were really lucky to have you as a student, as you played so many roles as a student ambassador. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're also very lucky to have you as their director of admissions. So aside from the obvious, Lisa, you know, <laughs> the location, the climate, being next yeah. to some of the most amazing beaches in the world, what is it? What is it about the University of California at Santa Barbara that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply yeah. and ultimately attend? Thank you for asking that because, you know, you're right. We're more than just a beautiful college on the beach. Uh, I think what makes Santa Barbara 
unique, which is why I've never wanted to leave and why I chose to raise my family in Santa Barbara, is I really believe this is a unique community. It's a small town. Uh, California beach towns tend to be a little more informal, you know, both in approaching people and being super friendly and outgoing. Uh, The dress is very casual. People are more into developing friendships and developing those kinds of bonds, less into the superficial. And that carries over into the university. So it really is one of those towns where you're a student and you run to Target to pick up some shampoo and you'll (laughs) run into one of your professors. Uh, Or you'll go to a restaurant and you'll run into one of your professors. And there's not... There's not a big division. We're all part of this amazing community. So you don't feel that traditional barrier that I think sometimes people feel student to professor or staff member to professor to student. We all love being in the community. Uh, The other thing that is very unique, and it goes back to how Santa Barbara was developed, is when the campus was developed, it was decided that departments should be very, very collaborative. So you'll see much more crossover here. For instance, a physicist working with a biologist or a computer science professor working with a music professor. So we pride ourselves in that type of interdisciplinary collaboration. It's hard to explain and describe and interdisciplinary doesn't sound necessarily that exciting. But what it does mean is you're not going to be siloed in your department. And I think that makes us very unique. And then lastly, only about 3% of our students are from Santa Barbara. So the reality is everyone is from somewhere else. And that means students just tend to be a little bit more outgoing about forming friendships. It's not cliquish. Um, You're going to get to meet people from other places, um, both state, national, globally. So it is a pretty unique little place. Well, we appreciate that overview. And I did not know that only 3% of the students are, in fact, from Santa Barbara. I love how you describe the community interdisciplinary opportunities. And by the way, I read a statistic that well over, well over 90%, the vast majority of your students actually return, which is a testament, Lisa, to the great work that you do in admissions. And of course, the great work that the university does to keep students on campus and happy. So, So let me ask you, I know that the University of California, Santa Barbara, receives thousands of applications. And like you said, from throughout the country and beyond, So Lisa, Mm -hmm. can you walk us through the process of how you evaluate so many applications? (laughs) Yeah, in fact, we are the number five campus in the nation in terms of number of applications received. (laughs) So for freshmen last term, we had over 111,000. Oh, wow. And then transfers (laughs) another 17,000 plus. So yes, it's a lot of applications. But I think when people hear or see those big numbers in our brochures, they assume that, well, a computer must make the decision. You couldn't possibly personally handle that many applications. And we actually do a personal review of every application. And it's not unlike what you probably hear from other even small universities where, you know, we're looking at depth at your the essays you write and the activities and your academics, we do all of those things as well. We just must do it quickly. And we bring in about 120 external readers and we train them in our philosophy, what we're looking for, what makes a good fit for Santa Barbara. These people are typically educators. They're counselors, teachers, and they help us read those applications. So Academics are always going to be most important, so we're going to focus on the academics first. Our faculty set our admission criteria, and they've made it very clear that academics should be our priority. So we're going to look at not just the GPA, but the types of courses you're taking. Did you challenge yourself? Was it a rigorous curriculum? Do we see a trajectory there? Do we see any bumps along the way that we hope you'll explain in your application somewhere? 
uh, sometimes we look at your major, not very often. Um, engineering, computer science, we look more closely at your major. Auditions, obviously, for music and dance. The reason we might look at your major is to see, for instance, if you say I'm passionate about the sciences, I might look to your activities list to see if there's evidence there that supports that passion. It's not easier or harder to get into based on your major, but it sort of builds the narrative that I develop around the application about what your interests might be. So I look at your academics. That's the first thing I do. And then I am going to look at your extracurricular list. And extracurricular for us means anything positive that you're doing outside of the classroom. So it might be a club. It might be, you know, church or your synagogue. It might be family obligations. It might be a part-time job. Basically, what do you do with your time outside of class? And then I'm going to read the personal insight questions, which we'll cover a little bit more in depth in a few minutes, I'm sure. But uh, what are you telling us about yourself? University of California does not use letters of recommendation. As you can imagine, with 111,000, we couldn't possibly manage all that paper. <laughs> um, so what we're basically asking you to do when you fill out your application, you're essentially writing your own recommendations. How you write your personal insight questions, the information you provide, all of that contextual information is the only bit of information we use in making our decision. I'll go in and I'll give it a score. Then a second person picks it up and they do the same thing. And if there's too much variance between what I scored and the other person scored, it goes to yet a third person. So anywhere from two to three people will review and score the application based on the criteria I just mentioned. So it's a very fast process. Information needs to pop off the page. You know, don't get too fluffy with writing those personal insight questions. I need that information to pop. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that comprehensive overview. I did not know that you don't require letters of recommendation, so we appreciate that piece of information. And also, you emphasize that the priority is the academics. So, Lisa, let's yeah. unpackage that just a little bit more. What can you tell us about the average profile of the current freshman class in terms of their GPA yeah. and any other data that you collect? Well, you know... I almost cringe at the idea of giving GPAs, but I will. <laughs> and the reason I say that is students see a number and they automatically decide, oh, I'm in or I might as well not apply because I don't stand a chance. <laughs> so the minimum GPA to be eligible as a California resident is a 3.0. For a non-California resident, it's a 3.4. Okay. And that's on a 5.0 scale. And our average is a 4.41 for the students who were admitted. And that's a weighted GPA with your advanced placement, your honors credit. But I will tell you, we are admitting students from that full range of GPA. We also are admitting you, we use the term a lot, in context. So for instance, I have background information about your school. I know how many honors and advanced placement courses, for instance, are offered. So if your school doesn't offer very many, I'm not going to expect that you have as many. And if your school doesn't offer as many, your GPA might not get bumped up as high as a student attending a school with a lot of courses that would be weighted and bump up their GPA. So that GPA is taken in context of what was offered at your school. How did you take advantage of that curriculum? So that's why you'll see it quite a wide range of grade point averages in our admitted class, not just that 4.41. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. 
As an affiliate partner with Prep Sportswear, the podcast does receive a small commission if you make a purchase. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel that would benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Well, we appreciate that. And again, let's unpackage it even further, Lisa. When reviewing a student's academic record, what are you looking for exactly and how do you evaluate it? Yeah. Um, first thing I do is pull up information about the school. So I get a sense of, you know, how big is the senior class? Is it a college prep school with a rigorous curriculum available to you? Or is it maybe a small rural school that maybe has limited course offerings? So first, I'm going to try to get a sense of what was available to you. Um, and then I'm going to look at what did you choose? What classes did you choose? Did you choose a more rigorous schedule um, where you had room for an elective? Did you choose teaching assistant or did you choose pre-calculus? You know, so I'm hoping that you challenged yourself. And again, I might look at your major just to get a sense of what kinds of things you're interested in, but it's perfectly fine to be undeclared too. So uh, you know, I might see in an undeclared student, a student who takes a variety of electives because they're trying to discover what their academic journey is going to be. Another student might talk about, I'm passionate about computer science and all their activities or programming and, you know, learning uh, computer languages. And so in that student, I might look to see, did they take an adequate level of math courses to do well when they get to the university. So that's the way I use major when I'm looking at the academics. And again, I mentioned earlier, if there's a bump along the way, maybe the student has done particularly well, but then one semester I see some struggles, maybe it's with just one class. Typically I will look to the personal insight questions or there's an academic section of the UC application where students can explain academic background. And I'm hoping that I see an explanation for what happened. It might be a perfectly reasonable explanation that I say, okay, that makes sense. You know, they had major surgery and missed two weeks of school or, you know, they had some kind of a family situation that I should be aware of. So it's really incumbent on the student to describe their academic journey so that I understand and get a sense of why did they choose the curriculum, especially at a school that offers multiple. Maybe your school offers international baccalaureate and a traditional curriculum, and you chose international baccalaureate. Tell me why you chose that. Give me some insight into uh, what your goals were when you, you chose to go that route. Well, those are great pieces of advice and insight. I particularly appreciate how you talked about if there's a dip or a bump in the record, students, it's very important that you take the time to explain why. Like Lisa said, right. there might be a reasonable explanation. Perhaps you had a surgery, perhaps something happened in the family. And we're going to talk about the essay shortly, but mm -hmm. you have to indicate your why so that it'll help your overall application. So again, yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for that. Yeah. And Lisa, what are the different ways a student may apply to UC Santa Barbara? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> because there's so many different ways you can apply these days, right? The Coalition app, the Common app. The <laughs> University of California has its own application. Okay. So we are not part of those other applications. University of California application only. You apply, and this is new this year. It used to be that you only applied during, you submitted your application during the month of November. This year for people applying for fall 23 and later, the application is open for submission in August. So you can start filling that out in August and you can hit that final submit button during the month of October, November, with the deadline being November 30th. UC does not have early admission, early decision, or any of those kinds of programs. You apply by November 30th. You will find out your admission status in mid-March to late March. And then you'll have until May 1 to let us know if you accept the offer. So I know it's confusing. Do I go early decision? Do I do early action? Any of those kinds of things? University of California, it's pretty straightforward. Use the UC application, apply during October, November, and that's it. Pretty clean cut. 
Well, that's definitely clean cut, and we really appreciate the explanation. And Lisa, I know that all the UC campuses are test free. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to our listeners how does being test free differ from schools that are test optional? Good. Thank you for asking that one. Test free means that even if you completed an SAT or ACT exam, we are not asking you for it. And in fact, the UC application won't collect that information at the time you apply. So when we talked earlier about criteria we use in making our decisions, you notice I didn't mention exams because they would never be used in any way in the selection process or in our scholarship process. So when I say academic criteria, I'm completely excluding examinations. So test-free means we do not use them at all. Don't send them. We won't ask for them. Even if you do send them, we will ignore them. Um, there are some UC campuses that will um, award uh, or use the exams for placement purposes once the student enrolls. So at the end of the process, after you have your decision and you've, in, you've accepted an offer, some campuses might say, if you have test scores, you can submit them now. But that happens well after the process of admissions. Well, we appreciate that explanation. And test-free really means test-free. That's for yeah. the admissions process, but also in terms of if you're going to give a student a scholarship or not, you do not use the test scores for scholarships either. So thank you so much for that. We really appreciate it. Sure. And, Lisa, and, and John, yep. if I can make clear Please. too, that that's not just the Santa Barbara campus, that's every UC campus. Right. That's the UC system. So that's great mm -hmm. information. Thank you so much, Lisa. And I was also curious, how important are students' courses in progress and grades in senior year? And Lisa, what are you looking for when reviewing them? Yeah, so senior year courses are important. The grade point average for the University of California application is really based just on grades 10 and 11. We ask you for what courses you took in ninth grade and we'll see the grades, but they're not computed into the GPA. Senior year grades, we see the course titles, but we will not use grades, nor do we ask for updates to the application with senior year grades at any point ex during the selection process. But I am looking at course titles. Again, I'm looking at, are they challenging courses? I'm looking at the quantity of courses. If I see a student, you know, decided to go home by noon each day and, <laughs> and you know, took maybe only three solids their senior year, I'm not impressed. So, I often see students taking more advanced placement courses their senior year, or they may be taking community college courses to supplement um, their interests. But I'm expecting to see a full schedule of classes the senior year. And don't think that the grades don't ever matter. Uh, because <laughs> once we admit you, it means we completely are impressed with you. We want you to come to our campus. We hope you accept our offer. If you do accept our offer, we're going to then say, fantastic. We look forward to you joining our community. <laughs> and by the way, when you graduate, send us your transcripts. And at that point, we do see the senior year grades. We compare them to all your grades to what you wrote on your application, because at the time you apply, it's all self-reported information. And I look to see how you did your senior year. And I would expect that your senior year performance is about the same as what I saw your junior year. Um, if there's a big dip, again, you might get a letter from us saying, we're concerned with what happened your senior year. Please explain. Uh, so you should plan to keep those grades up right to the very end because we do ultimately look at them. Well, we appreciate that. And thank you so much for the comprehensive explanation in terms of the importance of the senior year courses. Even though you may not be using them in the GPA, it's very important that students are continuing with the rigor, continue to challenge yourselves. And like you said, don't just take three main courses so that you could be home by 12 noon. I also appreciate, <laughs> Lisa, I also appreciate how you explained that the ninth grade courses are not taken into consideration, emphasizing how important grades 10 and 11 are also in your overall process. So thank you so much for that. So we mentioned the PIQs 
a couple of times already, which of course are the Uh personal insight questions. And my understanding is that there are eight to choose from and students usually have to submit at least four. So Lisa, what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? And what advice would you share with prospective students in terms of what to think about when sitting down to answer these questions? Wow, there's a (laughs) lot there. Well, first of all, let me explain philosophically why we call them personal insight questions, because students use the term essay. So when we were redesigning the application years back, we understand that this is a stressful process. And typically, it's those college essays that cause students the most stress. And we literally were looking for a way to reduce some of that anxiety in our process. When you hear the word essay, that's a formal piece of writing. And students have been going through four years of English in high school learning the proper format for an essay, the introductory sentences, the closing, etc. It is a formal piece of writing. We don't want students to approach our questions in that way. We call them questions because we just want you to answer our question directly. We don't want you to feel like you have to come up with a creative writing piece. We don't want you to feel that it's a writing sample. We are using these questions purely for contextual information. If you're admitted and you accept our offer of admission, we will ask you to take a writing placement exam. That's the point at which we will judge your writing and place you in the appropriate freshman writing courses. But for this purpose, we just want to get to know you. So it's just a question. It's not a formal essay. There are eight questions. The students can choose whichever four most resonate with them. They should answer the questions directly. Again, throw out the fluff, throw out the creative writing, don't give me quotes, just answer the question directly. If you visit the Santa Barbara admissions website or the University of California website, there is a handout that you can download that's a worksheet that kind of walks you through some of the contextual information we're hoping to get from you within that particular question. So we don't want these to be a mystery to you. We want you to know exactly what we're asking and we want you to provide that information. It's a chance to tell us about your academic passions or you might be the student who says, I'm undeclared, I'm, I'm exploring, here's are the kinds of things I'm interested in. We want to know about your family background, uh, your motivations, what are the things you've been involved with that are most meaningful, um, any challenges, do not manufacture hardship. But if there is a hardship or a challenge that you feel is important for us to take into consideration, there is a place for you to provide that information in one of the questions. So it really is just a factual piece of writing. The biggest tip I can give you is to write them more in the form that you might write a short newspaper article. <laughs> you know, if you if you open up your local newspaper and go to an article that's short, you will see that it's very factual. There are not a lot of fluffy transitional sentences. There's not a big opening that sets the stage for what you're going to talk about. They just go fact, 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 fact. That's what I want you to do as you're thinking about writing. If you use an adjective to describe yourself, give me some concrete examples. If you were to say, for instance, I'm a natural leader, for instance, I took the lead in fundraising for a senior year project and here are all the things that I did to accomplish that. Here are the people I interacted with. So give me examples of the adjectives you use to describe yourself. That makes it more concrete in my mind as a reader. Those are the ones that the readers remember. If you make it too general and fluffy, 
we forget it because remember with 111,000, we're moving very quickly and you want yours to stand out. And the way to stand out is to be real, use your own voice. Okay. I, I was talking to a group of students the other day doing an application workshop and said, if you don't use the word plethora in your everyday language, <laughs> then I should not see the word plethora in your personal insight questions, right? It should sound like you. It should be fun and you should have multiple drafts um, because you really can tell, I can tell when I'm reading if it's a first draft or not. There's right. usually too much fluff and not enough concrete information. And, uh, you know, one last tip I would say is I know you're busy seniors. I know you have so much on your plate and it's so exciting to be back in school in a more normal um, setting with the pandemic coming behind us now. And so you want to get really involved in school and you're busy. It's very tempting to take the essays you wrote for the common application and plop them into the UC form because you don't have to write yet another set of, you know, writing samples. Don't do it because right. the style right. of the common app is a formal essay. And we are asking you to answer questions in a less formal style. So typically I can tell if someone's just sort of recycling you know, an essay, because it doesn't really fit the model of a personal insight question. Well, that was a tremendous overview filled with great pieces of advice and examples. Thank you so much, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate how you talked about the whole process through the UC system. It's not about writing an essay, right? An essay has a different kind of connotation, but this is really to reduce anxiety and what you're really looking for is you just want to, like you said, get to know the prospective student. And I really appreciate that and how you explain that there is an essay, but that's after you're accepted. And it's not about writing for acceptance or to be admitted, but it's for placement, right? So it's right. a little less stressful than, oh my God, am I going to be accepted to UC Santa Barbara? So again, great mm -hmm. answer. Thank you so much for that. So my next question then, Lisa, is what are some examples of things you're looking for beyond the work that students did in the classroom? Mm -hmm. You know, I think students frequently think that there's this magic formula, you know, uh, a, a, a recipe that they can follow that will lead to an admission offer. So they'll say, how many AP classes exactly do you want to say? Or how many clubs should I have on my list of clubs? <laughs> and there's no recipe. There's no secret and sauce, Lisa? No secret there's sauce? not a secret <laughs> sauce. There really is not. So let me give you a couple of examples. I have some students who are passionate about maybe a particular thing. I am passionate about water polo. I've been in the pool since I was three years old and I play on the varsity team and I'm captain of my varsity team and I also play in a private club water polo and I spend my summers traveling, competing nationally in water polo. So that's what I call my specialist. And when I'm reviewing that student, I might be really impressed that they have this passion and they have dedicated a lot of time and effort to taking that passion as far as they can take it, you know, during their time in high school. I have other students, again, who are still very much in an exploratory stage of their life. Like, well, I, I, I'm thinking of pre-med, but I also love the arts. And I also like, you know, uh, I'm an environmentalist and I'm really passionate about that as well. So for that student, their activity list might look completely different because I'm not sure which of those three I like more. So I'm joining different clubs and doing different volunteer work across all of those areas so that I can explore. And by the time I get to college, have a better idea of what I might be interested in. It would be helpful for that student to then maybe in one of their personal insight questions, explain, I'm an exploring student and this is why I've have such a range of activities. These are the things that interest me and I'm exploring them now. So that's why I say there's no magic recipe because some students know what they're interested in. 
some don't. Um, we are looking for students who are not just dabbling. You know, right. I, I want to find that right. student who's exploring. I don't want the student who's building a list so it'll look like, oh my gosh, I belong to 50 clubs. Really, if you're in 50 clubs, that means you occasionally go to a meeting here and there. It doesn't mean you've shown leadership in that club. It doesn't mean that you've brought creativity and new ideas to that club or maybe a new perspective and way of thinking about things uh, for the other members of that club. So those are the kinds of activities that really stand out where you feel like I have something to contribute. I'm going to show that I can take a leadership role. You don't have to be the president of the club. Maybe you choose to lead a project within that club. You also don't need to start your own club. Okay, I see so many students feeling like I need to start a club so I can say I started a club. I'm not necessarily impressed by that unless you're also impressing me that you're really passionate about that. You know, it's kind of obvious to the reader when it's, oh, I just formed this club. Well, will it have a legacy? Will it continue after you leave? Is it having an impact? Is it changing your school environment? Is it influencing the way your friends think? Those are the kinds of things I'm interested in knowing. And then I also said anything is extracurricular. Maybe you have a part-time job because your family needs help financially, or maybe you have a part-time job because you're passionate about a business career and you want experience in being an intern at a real estate office, and that's giving you that kind of experience. Uh, or maybe you are very active in a faith-based organization because that is close to your heart. So there's no right or wrong. I need you to explain to me why you're doing it and then give me details about it. So don't just say in the activity section, I'm on the baseball team. You know, give me a little bit more. There's room for you to tell me leadership positions you've had within the team, um, different positions you've played on the team, uh, what kind of a legacy you've built on that team. So use that extracurricular section to embellish some of the points that perhaps you made in your personal insight questions. Well, again, that's a great overview and tremendous pieces of advice. I love how you talked about there's no right or wrong, but be specific in terms of your why. Whatever it is that you're yeah. doing, why are you doing it? And exactly. don't hesitate to explain it in detail. And I also appreciate how you explain that having a part-time job is something really important. Perhaps you have to help the family. Perhaps, like you said, you want to go into business. And so this is your first real experience in the business world. And if you're working full-time or after school every day, maybe that's the reason why you're not in 10, 20, 30 clubs. And as you indicated, you really shouldn't be in that many clubs anyway, students. <laughs> it's really quality over quantity. So Absolutely. Lisa, great answer. Thank you so much. This has been terrific. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, can you explain what opportunities does UC Santa Barbara offer students that may have had an IEP in high school in terms of helping to ensure mm -hmm. that once they arrive on campus, they continue to be successful? You know, there are so many resources. Every campus will have a disabled student services office for students who have a diagnosed learning disability or physical mobility, visual, hearing issues. Um, we have people who can assist you with, for instance, note taking or arranging extended time on an exam, if that's what is called for to support you academically. So there are specific services for that. But also the biggest tip to get you started in college is guess what? The most successful students are the ones who use the tutors. Okay. So whereas in high school, you may think tutoring is to help catch you up. In college, tutoring is about getting the extra edge. And so we have services on campus. It's called CLASS, Campus Learning Assistance, where uh, you can, maybe you have a term paper due for your history class. You can sit down with a writing tutor who can help you sort of draft out your outline and then we'll help review uh, what you've written so far, give you feedback, point you in the right direction to research resources for you. Uh, that's a great service. We have drop-in 
math tutoring always available. We have study centers. So maybe you find that, you know, you're used to taking short answer exams and you're finding a lot of your classes at the university are essay exams. So you can do tutorials on how to take an essay versus a multiple choice versus a short answer exam. So we have two different learning centers on campus for just study skills, time management, you know, how to organize yourself, uh, study tips, things like this. So you can get extra help for a specific subject or just organizational study skill tips. University studying is very, very different than high school studying. You're going to find at university much more critical thinking is going to re be required. So as opposed to an exam, perhaps just asking you for a definition of something, it might be more along the lines of, here are two popular theories of sociology. Compare, contrast, which one do you support? Asking you to critically analyze. And that's not something a lot of students have experience with. And there's a certain style of learning. You're gonna read your textbooks differently if you're asked to analyze versus to remember definitions. So there is a lot of support for that, knowing that students don't necessarily have all of those skills coming out of high school. And that's part of the reason high, uh, universities have general education courses. And we usually advise students, don't jump right into your major. Don't try to take four classes in your major your first quarter here because Learn this new analytical style of learning, teaching, writing, exams before you jump into that heavier coursework within your major. But tons of support here for you. Well, I really appreciate how you talk about this analytical style of studying and how it's not necessarily the norm for all students in high school. And mm -hmm. so as part of the transition to college, it is important to go to the study centers, seek the help early and often to help you be successful once on campus. So again, we really appreciate that, Lisa. Thank you so much. And this has been a tremendous conversation. I always put in the show notes, the Office of Admissions, in this case, obviously, UC Santa Barbara. Lisa, if there are any other resources that you want me to share with the students and parents, just please give them to me. And of course, I'll make them available to the students. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this because unfortunately, this leads us to our last question, which is, what are your top three pieces of advice that you would give to students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Well, besides the fact that I want you to explore UC Santa Barbara, <laughs> I would tell you, and this might sound funny coming from me because we brag about our rankings and we are an extremely well-ranked university nationally. <laughs> but I would tell you my per first piece of advice is ignore the rankings. <laughs> Because even if that university is ranked number one in the nation, if it's not a good fit for you, you are not going to do well. And I, I explain to students all the time, think about how you feel when you're excited about life, right? You try new things, you explore, you're more curious mentally, you go out and meet people, you, you push yourself a little bit more. When you're depressed, you lay around on the couch because you're just not motivated, right? So going to a school that makes you happy is the world of difference in how you're going to do academically. So ignore the rankings, ignore the big name uh, obsession that many students have, and instead focus on where am I going to study and blossom? What kind of environment do I find myself energized? Is it in a smaller place or is it in a big city? Is it a small campus where I get one-on-one -on -one time with my professor or do I like the excitement of a big place? So really spend some time doing some self-exploration about what environments do you get fired up? And guess what? It might be different than your best friend. So if your best friend is looking at college A, great for best friend, but college B might be better for you. So try to ignore that pressure to go with the big name, the big ranking. I'd also say go to the source. Admission counselors are here because we want to admit you. That's, that's why I pursued this job, right? 
I will give you the honest answers. And so will every other college rep give you the honest answers. What I see on social media and um, chat rooms and such about college admissions is very frequently wrong. So go straight to the source for your information. And be aware that a lot of colleges could care less about demonstrated interest. This is my new pet peeve (laughs) because students will write to us and they'll say, well, I did a little research on your professor so-and-so and and I would like to learn more about professor so-and-so's research and could you share more information with me? And I think they're just doing that sometimes to show that they're interested and thinking that that might make their chances for admission better. Public universities are not using demonstrated interest. So come take a campus tour so you can decide if it's the right fit for you. And I'm not going to give you extra weight, the admission decision or not, whether you take a tour. I just want you to learn about my campus. So use our websites, use our information sources that we provide. Beware of external. This podcast is obviously legit. Um, But you know (laughs) what? Information on social media often isn't. So be careful where you're gathering your information. Well, Lisa, this has been a tremendous conversation, and those are great pieces of advice. I I love them all, particularly when you said, ignore the rankings, and (laughs) you mentioned ignore where your friends are going, because the number one school in the country, whatever that means, by the way, might not be the right fit for you, but taking the time to know, do you want to be an airplane ride away from home? Do you want to be a car ride from home? How long is right for you? Do you want a big school, a small school? Do you want an urban, suburban, rural environment? All of these things are so important and too many students don't take the time to really reflect and think about what's the right fit for themselves. They look Mm -hmm. at friends, they look at rankings. So I appreciate you emphasizing that so much. Mm -hmm. This has been awesome. I am so happy because I know it's going to help so many students and their parents. Lisa, thank you so much for your time, your expertise. We really appreciate it. And I hope to have you again soon. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.